When a narcissist knows you are waking up from the psychological coma they have put you in, you are seeing through them, you are gaining clarity and you are about to expose their true real nature, they pull one of the cleverest tricks to stop you in your way. They ask a very invalidating question that instantly freezes you and the question is just give me an example of when I did that. Give me an example of when I abandoned you. Give me an example of when I gaslit you. Give me an example of when I manipulated you. Give me an example of when I abused you. Especially if it is a covert narcissist that you're dealing with who never raises their voice, never verbally abuses you, has never put their hands on you. Now, what example will you give them? You know it as a pattern. It has happened over again and again and again. And you have so many memories, so many experiences that you can't just come up with one quite instantly. And they create pressure. They don't let you think. They don't let you breathe. Because of your trauma, your brain is not able to process so much information at once and it goes blank. And there they pull the other trick. See? See, this is what I'm talking about. You have no example. You have no proof of what I am doing or what you think I am doing. They counter gaslight you further. For example, you tell them, you abandon me or you neglect me. And then they will ask you for an example. Now, you can't give them an example. It's a felt sense. It's an experience. There are so many things that have happened, but because your brain is so traumatized that it can't pull up a memory, they take advantage of that psychological injury and then give you counterexamples. They might say, you blame me for abandoning you, but every single time we fight, I am the one who comes to fix it. I am the one who wants to have sex with you. I am the one who acts nicely. I am the one who is willing to forget, forgive and move on. Yet you hold on to a grudge. You are the one who still feels angry, needs space, needs time. You are the one who is oversensitive. And, and you have the audacity to blame me for abandoning you? Come on, in what world do you live? So they bend your reality, they reshape it, they reshape your thought processes, especially your perceptions, and you then start thinking, what the hell is wrong with me? This person is so right. Yes, they're the one who comes to fix the situation after we have had an intense fight. They're the one who wants to quickly move on. They're the one willing to forgive. They're the one who wants to get intimate I'm the one not ready for it, so it must be my fault. I must be making it up. And that is how they evade responsibility. That's how they stop you from holding them accountable. Do you see how deep this tactic goes? Just one question can destroy your entire perception and experience of it. Your body knows the abandonment. Abandonment happens when they do not want to talk to you, when they give you silent treatment after you have done something opposite to or different from what they wanted you to do. When they treat you like a wall and it feels like you have turned into a ghost. That is a felt sense experience, isn't it? Now, you can't give them an example, oh, when you did this and this is what happened. Because even if you were to give them an example, they'll say, come on, you are exaggerating things. I was silent because you asked me to give you space. Now, is it a sin to listen to you? I don't know what I'm supposed to do, to give you space or not to give you space. Because when I give you space, you think I am abandoning you. And when I talk to you, you think I am trying to manipulate, manipulate you. What am I supposed to do? The double mind. This is what is called crazy making. This is how they enter your head and mess up things. And you are forced to think differently in a way that only serves the narcissist and no one else. Moreover, what you need to understand is that trauma memories are not stored the way normal memories are stored. This is also the reason why you can't give them an instant example. 
For example, you have a normal experience. You went out, you had a dinner date with your kid or something nice. It's a positive, happy, non-stressful memory and it gets stored. The information gets processed in your prefrontal cortex and then it gets further processed by hippocampus where memory consolidation and storage happens. And then it's taken to subconscious. You don't always remember it, but you can recall it. And we call it sequential recall, which means you can remember what happened in the beginning. You were preparing for the event. Then you went out, then you ordered food, you enjoyed food, children were happy, you were happy. That is the end. So every non-traumatic memory has a beginning as well as an end and it's processed, that's how it is properly stored and that's why we're not confused about it. But do you know what happens to a trauma memory? Trauma memory is stored in bits and pieces, not as a sequence of events. That's why when you have flashbacks, you remember that one thing that happened or you have that one visual or one emotion, one sound, one smell can trigger an intense reaction. Trauma is stored as a reaction not a memory. It gets fragmented, split into bits and pieces. It doesn't have an end or a beginning. And that is what you get lost in. That is what it means to have a trauma brain. You can't give them an example because your hippocampus has not been able to get a hold of that memory, process it properly because of that helplessness, powerlessness and hopelessness you felt in that situation when you were dealing with a predator. But nobody would acknowledge that. Of course, they have nothing to do with it. And if you are incapable of giving them an example, it's seen as your biggest failure. Prolonged exposure to chronic stress also causes functional brain damage. I have created a separate episode on this, which you can watch right now by clicking the i button above. But functional brain damage is when your brain structures change and memory storage Consolidation and retrieval doesn't happen properly. In simple words, you are not able to remember things and that's why you struggle with dissociative amnesia, which is another phenomenon. Dissociative amnesia is a coping mechanism where your brain forgets all the painful things because if it remembers them, you will be in constant pain. So it buries them deep down in the layers of your unconscious mind beyond your capacity to recall them. That's why a lot of us narcissistic abuse survivors of childhood trauma are not able to remember what exactly happened in our childhood. We just know something happened, but we can't exactly remember what happened. That's why three to nine years clean, nothing, with blank slate, I don't remember what happened. That is a coping mechanism, which unfortunately also gets triggered in a narcissistic relationship and you're not able to recall anything at all. That's why it's difficult for you to comprehend things, understand things, read things, because your cortex is not functioning properly. We call it diminished executive functioning. This whole thing in entirety is called deep traumatization and the narcissist exactly knows how to weaponize it against you. Do they know all of this information? Of course not. But what they do know is you won't be able to think of an example. You, they corner you and you become this little scared mouse and they know you won't be able to think of anything because you're frozen. Your nervous system is not allowing you to go beyond what's happening right now. And that is what is called being held in a torture chamber. That was it for today's episode. I hope you found it insightful. If you did, let me know in the comments. Also, let me know if you have experienced something like this. I will talk to you in the next one. Until then, as always, let the healing begin and continue.